One of the really exciting things I think about being in genomics today is that we use very modern tools to access very ancient variation. So this variation has been, in some cases it's been saved in our gene banks. Um, and we can go to the gene bank and get many of the seeds that you, uh, from the plants you see here. But we also know that many of these are just growing as weeds on the sides of farmers' fields all over the rice growing uh, part of the world, meaning mostly Asia and Africa. And just by collecting wild and weedy ancestors that nobody assigns any value to at all, um, we're amassing a larger and larger pool of variation from which we can draw and build our new breeding um, our new breeding stocks and new breeding strategies for the future. And it's entirely dependent um, on being able to understand the value that you can't see. So it's a genetic value, but you can't see it. But what is not obvious is that if you actually want to enhance the yield of a high yielding rice cultivar today, your best strategy, your most rapid yield increase, may come from crossing to a low yielding wild ancestor. And that's what our lab's been demonstrating how to capture that var variation in a high value product for the breeding community and then making that information available publicly so that people all over the world can better utilize this amazing fount. This is a wealth of variation that we just haven't been using. We never knew really how to do it efficiently. So one of the things that we try to exploit here is the variation that's available in the wild species of Ariza rufopogon or Ariza nevara, which are the ancestors of cultivated Asian rice as well as Ariza barthii, which is the ancestor of cultivated African rice. It has, the wild ancestors always have more variation than the cultivars, which are a small subset of the alleles and genes and variation that's available originally in their ancestor. In the case of Asian rice, um, we think we've captured about 40%, but anyway, less than half of the variation that we know exists in the wild ancestors. You can see the variation morphologically in some cases because the wild has certain growth habits that make it completely obvious that they're not cultivated types. I'm looking at um, really the morphological and the genetic diversity of these plants. and it's very important to consider also the, the wild ancestor species to our cultivated crop plants because we can look for genetic diversity and also the morphological diversity represented by that genetic diversity in these wild ancestors that is not present in our cultivated crop plants today. And I'm looking for, specifically now in the greenhouse, looking at different shoot and reproductive architecture um, traits. This is a close-up of an Ariza rufopogon panicle. It's showing very wild characteristics. You can see these long ons. And um, this panicle is, is in bloom right now. Um, so each of these spikelets, these individual things that look like rice grains, is a rice flower. Another trait of the wild species is that it, it has seed shattering, which is to say that the seed will fall off of the panicle when it's ripe. Um, in the cultivated species, we bred against shattering seed um, for non-shattering seeds so that the seed stays on the panicle and is much more easy to harvest. But you can see that if I flick this panicle, the seeds that are ripe will fall off, and that is seeds shattering. So what we're really doing is going back into the wild gene pool, and we're going fishing. We're actually trying to just randomly find things that are useful when they're introduced through traditional crossing into the cultivars. So some of the traits that we actually are able to capture include things like a tremendous boost to yield, even though the wild ancestors have very low yield potential. But it turns out that there are hidden or cryptic alleles in these wild ancestors that when you cross them over, they can enhance the yield of the best high yielding varieties that we have in China, in Indonesia, in India, in the United States, in Latin America today. These are the lines that we've bred that carry 
integrations or components of the wild ancestral species. This was one of the lines we used as a donor in, in a combination with a high yielding US variety called Jefferson. And this is the kind of plant that is now um, performing, outperforming its original Jefferson parent due to a small bit that was transferred from this wild parent. And you can see that the new plant actually looks very much like the original semi-dwarf Jefferson. It has good, thin, long grain type uh, of seed, which is what the customer wants, the consumer wants. And yet it carries genes from this wild ancestor that make this plant yield 20% more than the original US variety that we started with. We're doing the same thing with respect to drought tolerance, aluminum tolerance, and a number of other traits related to both biotic and abiotic stress or disease resistance and nutrient uptake and ability to withstand heat or cold or, or water stress. So the, the, the outcome and the message here is that the variation in these wild plants, as beautiful and unusual and sometimes spectacular as it is, is not what we're transferring. What we're transferring are hidden traits, traits that you can't see. So that the behavior of the new plant is very much like what we're accustomed to and we just get more of the yield that we want.